week 16 uh, of perfect person of Jesus, the study in Matthew's gospel. We're going to be hopefully finishing up Matthew 6. Uh, if you were in 815, you know that's what we're preaching from today. So there's a little bit of a doubling up for you uh, if, if you're in the classic service, because uh, actually all three services were preaching out of this passage. But you in Agape, you get the extended cut because you get all the stuff I didn't get to say in the sermon today. So that's always a lot of fun. Anyway, before we get into that, uh, some, some guiding principles that I want to highlight. First of all, you know, we've been talking about how the different Gospels present Jesus. And, and because Matthew is writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, his priorities are to help them understand the continuity between the Old Testament and, and the New Covenant in Jesus Christ. How does that work out? And so Matthew is talking to the people about what it means for Jesus to be the continuation and, most importantly, the completion and fulfillment of all the promises that God gave his people in the Old Testament. He is the perfect Israelite. He's the one that, that succeeds where everyone else fails. But then also you have this, this whole Davidic kingship thing that goes on in, in the book of 2 Samuel and then the covenant that, that God gives to, to David um, in through, the, through the kings and through the line of Solomon. And so what, is, what do we do with that in the new covenant? Well, Matthew sets that out, that Jesus is the completion also of the Davidic kingship covenant. So you've got this covenant continuity that goes through the book of Matthew. And then also one of the big things is that Matthew wants to help us, the followers of Jesus, this king of kings, the king after the line of David, help us understand how to live as his followers. So you've got this, these, these discourses, these five discourses that, that kind of punctuate Matthew's gospel, teaching us what it means to live as followers of Jesus, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven on earth. And part of that is Jesus makes a contrast between the the kingdom ethic that he's presenting and, and how the religious leaders of the day and the civic leaders of the day are, are, are living their lives, specifically targeting the Pharisees and the scribes, but also the Sadducees come into play later and then some of the civic leaders too. And in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 is, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds or is greater than or is better than that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees made a lot of their righteousness. They were very proud of their righteousness. But there was a difference in the righteousness that Jesus was advocating and the righteousness that they were advocating or that they were celebrating in their own lives. Theirs was behavioral while while the, the righteousness that Jesus is calling for is not strictly behavioral, but it is, it is heart level, it's emotional, it is birthed from the center of who they are. So Jesus begins to uh, unpack what it means in the, in the Sermon on the Mount to live into this better righteousness. And one of the ways he does that is through this this. A series of contrasts. We call it the six antitheses. Um, the, the idea, Jesus says to his disciples, you've heard it said, but I say to you, he quotes the Old Testament. He quotes uh, or he alludes to the teachings of the, the religious leaders of the day, but then he expands on that teaching, deepens that teaching to describe a better righteousness. Okay. Um, it's important, too, to remember that the Sermon on the Mount represents a kingdom ideal, okay? We are to strive for that ideal. Those that say it is, it's meant to strictly teach us about our, our depth, the depth of our sin, it does that, but it's not strictly about that. It is designed to help us understand how to live as God's people right here and right now, but it also reminds us that we do have a savior and we have a need for a savior because we just can't we cannot measure up now that doesn't mean we give up but by the power of the holy spirit we are transformed more and more into his righteousness the final contra or the um jesus then further pronounces the contrast we talked about this the last couple of weeks in describing the rel religious leaders as hypocrites hypocrites literally means what a stage actor, someone who lives for uh, 
the applause and the praise of others. This becomes the fullness of their reward here on earth. But citizens of Christ's kingdom do what they do, live not for the applause of other people, but live for the applause and the recognition of God, um, the Father, as Jesus said. Now, we've unpacked all of what that means, but it's, it's still, it, it gets us into the final antithesis uh, or, or the final uh, uh, set of contrasts. We, we, we dropped off last week by talking about the Lord's Prayer and all of that, all that that means and all the, 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 the values of that. But then Jesus moves into this conversation on fasting. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. This is where we left off. It says, When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. Again, there's that, that word hypocrite. For they disfigure their faces that, they, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So he has this whole conversation coming from the sixth antithesis into this, this concept of a private righteousness, and we lost it again. The final contrast here then has to do with fasting. Now, fasting is uh, something that Jesus makes a, a lot out of throughout his, uh, throughout his ministry. But the act of giving up food and drink for a given period of time in order to focus one's attention more fully on the Lord was at the heart of what the religious leaders would often do. This portion of Scripture is very similar to the preceding portions, and it has to do with a voluntary fast rather than a prescribed fast. There were prescribed fasts at various holy days for all Jewish people, especially on days like the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Now, while it seems obvious that, that Jesus, um, he kind of assumes that his disciples will fast. He doesn't say, if you fast, what does he say? When. It's not if you pray, it's when you pray. It's not if you give to charity or give to the poor, it's when you give to the poor. The idea is that, that the behavior of the Pharisees and the scribes is assumed. That's the, that's the fair, remember Jesus is talking about a better righteousness. So the assumed righteousness of God that, that Jesus is talking about is the Pharisees' behavioral level. He's saying that better righteousness, but when you fast, so there's this idea of a voluntary fast, but that is better than the fast of the Pharisees. So it's obvious that Jesus assumes his disciples are going to fast. However, this is the only place in the entire New Testament where fasting is explicitly taught as a practice. In Matthew chapter 9, the disciples are accused of not fasting. While John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, do fast. Jesus defends in that situation their lack of fasting. Now there are some positive examples of fasting in the New Testament. Luke chapter 2, verse 37. Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and 3. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. But there's no, no direct teaching in the New Testament about how to do it other than here. Often, how often or what specifically you are to fast, none of the epistles give a kind of an explanation of it or even encourage it, but it is assumed by Jesus here. The fasting that is done by the followers of Jesus is a different sort than the practices of the Jewish people because it's one filled with hope and joy rather than mourning and repentance. Now, fasting is a... Like so, when do, when do when do modern Christians typically fast? When is a time period when they typically fast? During Lent. During Lent. Now we kind of expand that. I don't know anybody that fasts like hardcore for forty days. anybody anybody know anybody that does that? Like doesn't eat for forty days? Does anybody? Forty minutes. That's yeah. That's <laughs> it's a holy forty minutes, isn't it, Jeff? But what do people, how do we define fasting today? Just giving up something. Now, what is it supposed to be? Now, what is it supposed to be? Okay, it can be food, yes. It can be food because 
but what else? What's it? One of your weaknesses, okay, yeah. Well, I think it depends on, yeah, so it depends on if you're giving up something that takes away your attention from God. If it does that, that's sin. You should, that's not fasting, that's repentance. But it, because like eating food is not a sin, right? Not eating too much food is a sin. But eating food is not a sin. It's eating something that, or it's, it's, it's giving up something that is important for our fleshly person. So in, at Lent, we tend to not fast those things. We don't tend to fast things that are necessarily important. We tend to fast the luxuries, right? Like, what's, uh, anybody want to guess what the most popular fasting for in, or fast is during Lent? Chocolate. Do you need chocolate to survive? I knew I was going to get somebody. I knew, uh, yeah, dark chocolate is healthy, so yes, you need that to survive. I mean, you don't need it, though, right? I mean, you give it up, your body's probably going to be, it's going to be hurting for a little while, but eventually it's going to be like, thank you, right? I, I totally agree. I agree, but it's, but is it, is it, the, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm laying this up is because what, what, what Jesus, because the, Matthew is not, so one of the things that I, it, it's, it's rearranging for me doing this, this particular lesson series with y'all is Matthew is very intentional about how he's arranged these lessons from Jesus. Now, I've said this before. The lessons that Matthew is putting in the Sermon on the Mount, did Jesus sit down and just all through these lessons? Probably not. Probably not. He might have, but probably not. Probably what Matthew is doing for effect and for, uh, uh, for direction, he's combining these various lessons that Jesus taught at various times, in Galilee more than likely, and arranging them in such a way that there's continuity. So Matthew is making a... a because, in, because in Matthew's mind, Jesus does have continuity in his head. Jesus is teaching one... Jesus is not teaching a series of lessons. He's teaching one continuous lesson about how to live as followers of, of, of his, as, as citizens of the kingdom. Throughout his entire three-year, three-plus-year journey, Jesus is teaching one lesson. How do you repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Remember, that's what Jesus... That was the content of Jesus' sermons. So, when we fast... We're get, the idea is that we're giving up something of value. Now, chocolate is of value. I'm not, I don't diminish that. It might be one level deeper to say you give up coffee. That's probably number two on the list. Hmm? Coffee's number one. But, but the idea, though, in, Lent, in Lenten fasting is we don't often approach it like that. We approach it from the standpoint of, I give up something that is not necessarily sin, but it's not necessarily survival either. And the fast that Jesus is talking about, and the reason that we know Jesus is talking about a different sort of fast is because of the way he compares it to the, the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the scribes, because they, they want everybody to know they're fasting. They're like, you know, drab, on down. Don't, I'm, don't worry, Jeff. I'm fasting. I'm not fasting right now, guys. I had a, I had a, I had a pretty good breakfast. Um, but so, so the hard part for us in our culture is we don't do that. We don't value that. Why don't we value that? Why don't we value that? Why is fasting not a standard practice for most believers. Because it's hard. That's, that's really it. It's hard and we're complacent. It's hard and we're lazy. Spiritually. Yeah, but for different reasons. Intermittent fasting. I get, I get, I get ads. And it's because my 
because our phones are smarter than we think they are. My, my, my phone knows I've gained a few pounds, and so it's like it's continually sending me intermittent fasting diet plans. I mean, well, I mean, is there not a more American thing than to take something that is supposed to be spiritual and religious and turn it into something egotistical? Is that, there's no, no more American thing than that. No more human thing than that, I should say. Probably it's not just American, but it's human. But Jesus is saying, okay, when we fast as believers, it's not, because see, the Lenten fast is this idea about mourning and repentance. You're thinking about the loss based on your sin. The mourning and the fasting that, Je- or the, the fasting that Jesus is talking about is not related to mourning, which is why in Matthew 9, when the disciples of John push back about the disciples of Jesus, not fasting, he says, you know, they're, they're with the bridegroom right now. It's not time for them. But for those of us who are post, post-resurrection, post-ascension, it might behoove us to take part of our time and fast. Why? To remember with joy the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus. The sacrifice in the fast and the joy in the breakfast right? The breakfast. Breaking the fast. So, how do you do it? There's a lot of, you can read lots of different lessons on how to do it. You don't have to do it all day to have a, have a meaningful fast. It could be like the, the old Catholics who gave up food on, or meat on Friday, right? Yeah, Chuck. How long would a typical fast last? In this day, in Jesus' day, it could, it could be a, ver- a varying length. See, the the Pharisees and the scribes, they would like want to push it. I mean, they, why? Because they want to... Now, it's interesting because, again, it's about their hypocrisy. It's about their wanting to be stage actors. Literally, they're wanting to be seen. And so they would go longer and longer so that their fasting was more and more obvious. And Jesus is like, that's the opposite of what it should be about. It's not about, it's not about you being seen. It's about you communing with the Father. That's a big fast. Yeah. And that's not, and listen, if that's, if that's, if I know, I've known, I've known pastors and preachers that a one day fast is a big fast. And listen, given, given the, the speed with which we do, we do work and ministry, one day fast is a big fast. I've known people that have done just a sunrise to sunset fast, like a, like a Jewish fast. You know, like they'll say, okay, I'm this day. I'm not. I will. I'm going to stop eating and drinking at sunrise. So whenever sunrise is, and then I'm not going to eat until sunset. Yeah, the very first one, they chow then they chow it down. No, actually, if you, I've done fasts before, and let me just tell you, you do not want to chow down after you've had a fast. That's the opposite. I've. We used to do a fast in my old church, and uh, with with some of the youth, we would do like a 40 hour fast. Let me tell you about hour 24. Those kids were hating me. And then we would do a breakfast the next day, like at, after, at the 40 hours. And I'd, got, I'd get a little legalistic about it. Not at hour 39 and a half. It had to be hour 40. I wouldn't let them. And let me just tell you, I did not make the kids make the pancakes and whatnot because they couldn't eat them until after. But I had some kids that would, they'd eat like the little pancake breakfast. I'd say, just eat one or two pancakes and that's it. And then didn't start getting in your cycle. Then they'd go out and they'd, they'd gorge themselves with like hot dogs and like McDonald's. And how many phone calls I get from parents. My kid's been throwing up all day. It's like, not my fault. I told them not to do that. You get sick. But yeah, so we, did a, we used to do a 40-hour fast. And that, we felt like we were holy. We felt like we were holy. Yeah, Kay. Um, I really like the thing about fasting and doing it with. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And again, it's not it's a, again, it's not that if you gain recognition for your righteousness, that is not God Jesus is not prohibiting that. Beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, "Let your good works shine before others that they might see the, those good works and Praise your Father in heaven. It's not that if, if your righteousness gains you recognition, that's not a bad thing. 
What is a bad thing is trying to be righteous in order to gain recognition, to seek it, to try to do these acts. See, and that's where the, the behavior of the, of the disciples and the behavior of the Pharisees was actually not to be all that different. It was the heart level behind it. I mean, literally in the Greek, Jesus says, disappear in order to be seen. Disappear in order to be seen. It's this upside-down kingdom. This is, it's not a phrase I came up with. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but I think maybe Dallas Willard talks about the upside-down kingdom. This is the upside-down kingdom of Jesus. Disappear, become invisible in order to be seen. Become weak in order to be strong. This is the whole M.O. of, of, of Jesus. Yeah, Terry. Yeah, but, yeah, to me, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, yeah. Very, very yeah. One to do and one to stop. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is. And that's why so many people will do like a fast, like at Lent, to remind them of the difficulty of sin. But when Jesus talks about fasting, he immediately, as, as Matthew organizes it, he immediately starts talking about treasure in verse 19. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break, break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither, wrath, neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." The eye is the, body, the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. What's that? Matthew 6, 19 starting with verse 19. Matthew 6, starting with verse 19. I'm sorry I didn't say that up front. Now, the, again, this is all, there's a continuity between the teachings here. And a lot of times we kind of take this and we, we, we separate this section out and we pull it out all on its own. But it, it is tied to the preceding section very, very uh, poignantly by Jesus. Again, he's addressing the concept of a greater or better righteousness than the Pharisees and the scribes. The idea then is that not only do they perform their righteous acts before others, they also flaunt their status and their wealth before others. And, and they flaunt that status and that wealth to demonstrate that they're, they're blessed by God. It was a sign of great blessing and favor. And there, there may have been uh, independent, uh, independent uh, you know, settings for each portion of the scripture, Matthew has gathered them uh, together to underscore the unrivaled devotion that a follower of Jesus Christ must have in light of the pressures that exist in the world. So he talks about this, this critique of a desire for worldly possessions. Now we think um, often that sexual sins are the most heinous of the sins, but to Jesus materialism materialism was the most egregious john piper preached a sermon on this passage and he references the writer uh, randy alcorn and randy alcorn estimates that fully 15 15 percent of all of jesus teachings had to do with money and possessions 15 that's i mean that doesn't seem like a big number except you're talking about one topic more than a tenth of, 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 of Jesus' teachings had to do with money and possessions. The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who claimed to be a Christian himself, said that Jesus was a far more terrible robber than those who assault travelers on the highway as he consistently sought to undercut people's desire for comfort and superiority and, instre- and instead drove people to utter dependence on the provision of God. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 8, uh, 6, 8 through 10, If we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires, 
that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wavered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Not money itself. Money is not the root of all evil. What is it? It's the love. It's the desire for it. Many of Jesus' contemporaries thought, did, did believe what Jesus said. They did not believe that earthly possessions could compare to the eternal ones. But few were as radical in their assessment of it as Jesus was. Of course, Jesus' statements have been picked apart. Uh, John Mark Comer makes the point that even though most people believe Jesus lived as an essentially poor itinerant preacher, itinerant rabbi, based on these statements, he was actually at least somewhat comfortable in his life because he had fi financial benefactors throughout his ministry. We you can look at Luke chapter 8, for example. It talks about the wealthy women who funded his ministry, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, while secret disciples more than likely were benefactors as well. Now, was Jesus wealthy? By no means. Did he ever earn money as a carpenter? Uh, not in his ministry life. So before that, probably. Probably he had some sort of carpentry business. Now, we know Paul. What did Paul do for a living? He was a tent maker, right? In fact, today, if you hear a pastor is a tent making pastor, they have another job. And more and more pastors are tent makers. Not actually. We don't actually they don't actually make tent. I mean, some of them might, I don't know, but most of them aren't. Most of them do something else, but they but they have second jobs. Why? Because most churches can't afford pastors anymore. God bless FPC Lakeland. I mean, I mean that's just the, the truth of the matter. That's just the truth of the matter. Paul, Paul was a tent maker, even though he believed that, that, that congregations could support the work of the pastor. He, he did say, you know, a laborer deserves his wage, but he did not want to be an extra burden on any of those churches as he came in and, and went out because he was not the permanent pastor of any one church. So the idea is not extreme poverty. I mean, some people have taken these passages of Scripture uh, to, of Jesus saying that there's an extreme poverty that is the ideal. That's not what Jesus is saying. But, and in, in, in addition, Jesus is not railing against hard work. Paul tells the people in Thessalonica that those who are lazy, that are not working, they don't deserve to eat. But what Jesus is talking about is the accumulation of wealth to the point of distraction. And the reason that he gives is because one is impermanent and one is permanent. The treasures of this earth are impermanent. They're not worth... So if you're a person that invests, like you invest money in stocks, you want to invest in something that has a long-term earning potential. Is that right? I'm not an expert, so you're going to have to nod along if that's correct. Otherwise, you're going to have to school me right now. You, you don't want something that gives you short-term gains and then long-term losses, right? That's bad. I'm not an expert. You're going to have to tell me. That seems like stupidity. So what Jesus is saying here is investing time, energy, and resources in the accumulation of earthly possessions might seem, for the moment, short-term gains, but eternally, guess what? Loss. The old cheesy cliche that pastors used to say all the time, you can't hook a U-Haul up to the hearse. You guys ever heard that one before? There was a sketch that was made there about four or five years where someone had the hearse full of U-Haul. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't work. I mean, you can do it, but it ain't going with you, right? Short-term gains, potentially, but long-term it's a loss. Why? Moss, moth, moss, moss, and rust destroy. Now, in our day and age, they say, yeah, they actually don't. Plastic lasts forever, uh, but it ends up in a landfill. I mean, I drive by the county landfill, and let me just tell you, every year it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's disgusting. Yeah. So what good is it? Jesus says. It, it, it's, it's instead invest in something that has eternal purpose 
and value. James chapter 5, Jesus' brother, half-brother, gives a, a, a pretty stern warning to the wealthy in the churches. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Man, your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like Everybody thinks that James was probably going to be the softer brother. Absolutely not. But the idea is that those who invest in kingdom endeavors do not have to worry about destruction. Those investments are eternal, and they yield a heavenly return. The concept of good works on earth resulting in treasure in heaven, that was actually a common Jewish understanding. Jesus is, is borrowing that. But Jesus repeats the phrase quite often. In Matthew chapter 19, he, when he speaks to the rich man and he exposes his, his own desire for earthly treasures and he exhorts the rich man in Matthew 19 to give his possessions to the poor so he will have treasure in heaven. Paul uses the phrase in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that we just noted and he explains how Timothy should guide the rich in Ephesus. Notice though that neither in Jesus nor in James or, or Paul is it considered to be a, considered a sin to be wealthy? The assumption is that some will be rich. There's an assumption that the Nicodemuses and the Joseph of Arimathea's will be part of the community. But it's a matter of priority whether the wealthy see the basic needs of others as not being met and so respond. So if, 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 if Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and the wealthy women see the needs of others and they don't step in to try to meet those needs, that's sin. It's not that, there is no, that, that wealth in and of itself is sin, but it's the accumulation and the hoarding and the holding on to. The treasure principle that Jesus is talking about here then speaks to the heart. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He doesn't talk about where your money is there, your heart will be also. He's talking about your treasure, that, that which you value the most. That's where your heart will be. The cardia of a person is not simply the emotional center of an individual, but it is the driving force behind everything the individual does. Everything that that person, that, that you and I do, it's driven by our cardia, our will, our motivation. As Donald Hagner puts it, it's the center of a person's attention and commitment. It's the drive. When people talk about they have a drive, their drive is towards this or that, that's the cardia. So in verse 22 and 23, it seems like there's a break in this, this, uh, this thinking when Jesus talks about the eye is the lamp of the body. But it really is in context about the worry and the focus of an individual. The people to whom Jesus would have been talking would not have been wealthy. None of the disciples were hyper-wealthy. Now, some of them were a little more comfortable than we, we tend to give them credit for. Matthew himself was a tax collector, and while he had been a reformed tax collector, he still probably had some possessions. We think of Peter, James, John, Andrew. We think of the fishermen as being you know, poor, but not necessarily. They, they might have had a fairly successful business, or at least a moderately successful business, but they were not part of the wealthy elite. And yet at the same time, that does not mean that they don't worry about their wealth or about the comfort of their life. As a person focuses on the, the transient nature of, the, of worldly wealth and possessions, if that's the focus, then the entire faith life is suspect. It's not as though wealthy people can't have a deep faith. In fact, I know quite a few wealthy people who have a very deep faith. But it's a matter of focus. Their good and healthy eyes are focused on Jesus, and so they use the gifts that God have, has given them to Jesus' eternal purposes. The question, that's the question that Jesus, focus, uh, that Jesus poses. Where is your eye focused? Is it on the light of Jesus' eternal purposes, or is it on the darkness of accumulating more and more stuff, more and more wealth? And then in verse 24, Jesus makes the 
the, the, uh, the famous statement, no one can serve two masters. Every person is going to serve something. What does Bob Dylan say? You got to serve somebody. And he actually goes through like five, five six verses, George. Paul, Paul, uh, Bob Dylan goes through like six verses of who, who you can serve. Or he says you can serve the Lord. But everybody's going to serve somebody. And Jesus puts it this way. You're going to serve. It's not a, there is no I get out of serving. I'm, no, you are going to serve somebody. Even if you're an entrepreneur and you build your own business, you're going to serve the bottom line. You're going to serve something or somebody. It's about what are you going to serve. The love-hate dichotomy, it's not about the emotional state of the person. It's about the choices that, that someone makes regarding the direction of their lives. The word hate here is not meant, uh, is not meant to be a word equated with despise. We say, I hate something, we're, we're, we're kind of saying, I despise it. When George says he hates six-verse songs, he despises six-verse songs. Yeah. It's not quite despise, but it's on, it's on the trajectory towards despise, right? When Jesus says hate here, he's not talking about despise. He's talking about disregard. He's talking about disregard by a matter of degrees, right? So, there would be, although rare, in Jesus' day, in the Greco-Roman kind of situ- economic situation, there would be moments where a slave or a bond servant could have two masters. Typically, it was when a bond servant had to serve two brothers. But guess what? It didn't work. One, you'd have to make choices at any given moment who you were going to serve, and the, the other master would always get sort of jealous and pull back and forth, and it would suddenly burn a person out. It's very similar to people who have multiple jobs. Anybody ever had to have two full-time jobs before? Two full-time jobs? It's tough. It's really difficult to have two full-time jobs. Why? Why? Because the needs of one job are going to infringe upon the needs of the other. If you're working two eight-hour days back-to-back, that's 16 hours. How much time is left for you? Eight. I did that math right, right? 16 plus 8 is 24. There are only 24 hours in a day still, right? Did they take one away? I think with inflation, I think they might take one away from us. But if you have two eight-hour days, work days, back-to-back, you've got eight hours to, to do all your, all your personal stuff, like grocery sh- you know, stuff like you know, eating and sleeping, guess what? Burnout is on the horizon, and one of those jobs is going to win out, and one's going to lose. Jesus is saying, this is what's going to happen. Faith in God, living for the priorities of God, cannot, will not lead to to living for the priorities of this world. You cannot serve two masters. The the Talmud actually talks about how half-slaves were to exist, but it, it it doesn't really work. Unfortunately, though, most believers today don't understand this. Craig Keener underlines the problem. He says, one researcher suggests that professed followers of Christ, professed followers of Christ, take in 68% of the world's income. That, that's how much wealth followers of Jesus Christ have at their disposal. 68% of the entire world's income. And yet, only 3%, only 3% goes to the church, and even a smaller portion goes to world missions. We try to serve God in money. The word money is actually translated from the word mammon. You've probably heard can't serve God in mammon. It's actually commonly thought of as wealth, but, but in a more of a personified way. We think of wealth as this sort of objective thing over here, but when Jesus uses the term wealth, it's actually personified as a slave master, something that demands, demands devotion. And so 
a choice has to be made by a believer. Who are you going to serve? And of course, this then leads to an anxiety, a fear. This is actually what I preach on today. So if you haven't been to church, you're getting the extras. If you've already been to church today, you're getting the, the deleted scenes, so to speak. Um, he says this in chapter 6, verse 25. He says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The therefore in verse 25 indicates that this pericope ought to be understood in light of the preceding discussion on the accumulation of wealth and the larger context that Jesus is speaking about, about which Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is a, a lesson on comparative righteousness, the definition of the greater or the heart level righteousness of the disciples of Jesus, rather than the strictly, strictly behavioral or demonstrative righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus is not speaking to people in poverty, but speaking to people who have enough and yet are not overly wealthy. The temptation is always, and I'll be honest, this is how I always read this passage, the temptation is to continue to evaluate the status of the religious leaders who had more, far more than they needed to elevate the, the status of the religious leaders. Now, I've always thought of this passage as being about your basic needs. This is about, ba don't worry about your basic necessities. Well, if this is about the basic necessities only, guess what? Very, very, I'm talking tiny portion of the people in the United States, we could just rip this part and throw it out. Because almost every person in the United States is in the top 1% of, of income earners in the world. I'm, I'm talking the poorest of the poor in our, in our country are m almost in the top 1% of income earners in the world. So most of us, the vast majority, don't have to worry about our basic needs. Basic needs. Needs, not wants. Needs, not desires. Now, that's not the case for everybody, but that is the case for most of us. But this does matter to us because it connects to this, this, this discussion on the accumulation of wealth. And to that end, Jesus says, do not be anxious. The anxiety, the word used uh, six times, do not be anxious, is as much about fear as, a, as it is about worry. Fear that, that you won't have, not just what you need, but have what you want. This sleep-robbing sort of anxiety that attaches itself to survival, yes, and also striving for that which we think will give us value and status. That's the very thing that the religious leaders of the day might have done. Now, the term can also be used positively. That anxiety in the Greek can also be used positively as, as when it's used uh, regarding the care of another person. Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul uses that term that is translated negatively as anxiety, translates positively as care for the people in Philippi. The word here then is tied to, the to a rhetorical question. Is life not more than food, drink, and clothing? The answer is obviously, yes, life is more than all of those things, but those things are still essential to survival. But the anxiety over them actually robs a person of life. 
And so Jesus then points to two different illustrations from nature. It was a common practice amongst Jewish rabbis to do this, this very sort of thing, to gain theological, not just biological, insight from the, the nature that surrounds us. Job does this in Job chapter 12, verse 7 and 8. He looks at the sovereign hand of God and he says, Ask the, ask the beasts and they will teach you, the birds of the heaven and they will tell you, or the bushes of the earth and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you what? That God is sovereign and in control. Job looks at his plight and he says, I know that God is in control. Positively, the psalmist declares in Psalm 147, verse 9, that God gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. Psalm 104, verse 14, the psalmist writes there, You, God, O Lord, cause the grass to grow for the livestock and the plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth. Because God is the creator God, it should be obvious that we can learn from such observation of God's creation how we ought to live. So Jesus tells us to consider the birds and look at the lilies of the field. In both cases, observation and categorization, it's not the end he has in mind, but he says, look at them with the intent to learn. He's not saying, hey, you know what you need to do? You need to become a bird watcher now. Unless you want to be a theological bird watcher. I don't think that's a thing, though. It could be. So Jesus looks at the birds, and he says they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather. And again, he does this to demonstrate the contrast between the, the desire of God to provide for our needs and our worry about accumulating wealth. Birds don't accumulate. They don't store. Their nests are not made for it. They, they cannot store. They have exactly what they need for each day. This sounds very similar to the prayer that Jesus has taught his disciples to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Pointing back to the Exodus uh, wandering where they were given um, manna and quail for the day. Not for more than the day, unless it was the Sabbath, but just for the day. And this ties to the comparison of the worry of the Gentiles. Now, in, in, in Luke chapter uh, 12, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus, same, same kind of uh, lesson, he doesn't say consider the birds, he says consider the ravens specifically the ravens. Now, why would that be a significant detail? Ravens are unclean birds. They're ceremonially unclean. So if he's telling Jewish people to learn from unclean things, then God even cares for the unclean and the unrighteous. How much more does he care for his own people? From the birds, Jesus tells his disciples to consider the lilies to demonstrate the care of the Heavenly Father. Notice, it's interesting here, the lesson that Jesus teaches is not about simple coverings. So the people of that day, they didn't have a lot of garments. And so they, they, really talked, they really held tightly to their cloaks. In fact, the law concerning the cloak of a person was, was actually pretty intense. But what Jesus is talking about is not simply about basic clothing. What is he talking about? He's talking about splendor. And glory, he says, consider the lilies. And they are clothed in splendor and glory greater than Solomon, who was known for his wealth. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 3, a very famous passage, God, the Lord says to Solomon, ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And what does Solomon ask for? He asks for wisdom. And, and the Lord is like, wow, that's a great answer. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you that wisdom, and I'm going to give you all the wealth and the power that you didn't ask for. So it's interesting because in that case, Solomon isn't worried about wealth, and what does he receive? He receives the wealth by the sovereign hand of God. And Solomon was so wealthy and so well-respected, people came from all over just to see his splendor and his glory that who provided god provided but it was because he wasn't worried about it that it came now when solomon became worried about it guess what things did not go well for him that's when things started to change 
when he was worried about living into the wisdom and the righteousness of God, God said, I'm giving you the wisdom, I'm giving you the righteousness, and I'm giving you the wealth. But the problem is, we can't even go out, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live, live for the righteousness of God, so God gives me the wealth. That, that, then you're not doing it for the right reasons. <laughs> See how, how, how insidious sin is? This is the very thing that happens to Solomon. But, but Jesus says, not even Solomon in all of his splendor and glory is robed like the lilies. And some people believe this is actually a different type of flower that Jesus is talking about because they actually did use flowers, uh, the specific type of flower, to uh, fire their ovens. So he talks about it's thrown into the oven, um, very temporary. He says, but not even Solomon is clothed like one of these, and they do nothing for it. Jesus uses a formula to help his disciples understand the contrast here. He says, how much more, how much more valuable are you than birds or flowers? If the value of the lesser was afforded a position of consideration, then it would be logically obvious that the greater, us, would be afforded at least the same level of value. Jesus uses this technique again in Matthew 12 when demonstrating the limits of Sabbath prohibitions. We're going to keep talking about this next week. Uh, but we're at the end of the time. Uh, but it's enough to say that Jesus is making some really nuanced but very important points about our heart and our, our, our focus and what is driving our lives. And it's very difficult for us, especially in the West, to, to really hold on to that because we're pulled very strongly in the direction of of mammon and not the direction of god even for those of us who claim to be followers of christ it's really difficult because we're constantly bombarded with opposing messages so we're going to talk about what that means in the kingdom of this world versus the kingdom of god next week let's pray gracious god you are good to us and you do provide for us in abundance lord help us to rely on you more and more for our daily bread, and then to use the good gifts that you've given us for your glory and purposes and to support those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.